Good evening and welcome to Have I Got News For You. My name is William Haig and in taking on this job I'll be laying myself open to a barrage of disrespectful remarks and critical sniping from all sides designed to undermine my position. Nothing new in that, really. <laughs> in the news this week, at the UN, with the future of the world in the balance, the Zambian delegate regrets having the three-bean salad for lunch. <laughs> A surprise candidate is unexpectedly available to try out as host on Have I Got News For You. <laughs> and by the River Trent, Britain's worst angler peeps over the fence to see what happened to his fishing line. And his lot's team is the award-winning comedian who believes that she was a nocturnal animal in a previous life, right up to the moment she was flattened by a juggernaut and became <laughs> Linda Smith. <laughs> and with Paul Merton tonight, a man who in a recent newspaper column recounted a trip abroad, describing his companions <laughs> as big, fat, idiotic, useless, slack-jawed, knuckle-dragging, tattooed, pastry-faced, pockmarked, dim-witted, work-shy, gum-chewing, riff-raff. Well, what can you expect on the Sunday Times staff outing? <laughs> Jeremy Clarkson. <laughs> And we start with round one. Ian and Linda, it's that man again. <laughs> the Pope's going to be a host, is he? <laughs> that's uh, Prince Charles. Oh, that's Hello Magazine. <laughs> oh, and oh, that's, that's a hug. He's got a knife in that hand. Uh, <laughs> like yourself, Blair. So, uh, where is Tarek as he's heading for, according to The Sun this week? Is he heading for um, Prince Charles's ideal village, Poundbury? It's a village, only it's really unrealistic because it's, everything's really pristine and it's ultra posh. Well, it's got Terracazis in it. And it's got Terracazis in it. <laughs> and this, the son helpfully said that he might get a makeover and told us to look out for Terry Caziz. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, who backpedalled furiously the day after this report in the sun? Saddam on his way to Syria? <laughs> <laughs> Who did backpedal? Well, the son, actually, oh, because uh, <laughs> Tony Blair said he was absolutely mystified by it. And in an interview with The Times, Terry Kaziz's sister said he'd got much closer friends in France and Russia. <laughs> which is just as well, because we don't have any anymore. <laughs> what did Boris Johnson find in the wreckage of Terry Kaziz's? Oh, this House. was fantastic. Every other journalist in the world goes to Baghdad and comes up with a secret document. Boris goes in. Oh, I can't find any. Um, <laughs> but he goes to Tariq Aziz's old house and finds a cigar holder. Fantastic scoop, Boris. <laughs> and what else did he find in the house? Anybody know? Apparently found the Arabic version of the game of Risk. And so while, while, we've, all, while we've been here... Thinking about the weapons of mass destruction, Tarek has actually been sitting there on a Saturday night throwing dice with lots of little <laughs> plastic tanks and trying to invade Alaska. <laughs> it was Kamchatka you could never get in risk, wasn't it? Only from Alaska. Oh, right. Yeah. Now you have to come that way. No. So you, That's right. you were trying to take over the world early. <laughs> yeah. Yes. How's was, that going? I was more successful on the board. <laughs> I've seen you before. <laughs> Were you in Midsummer Murders? <laughs> no, it was, uh, it was not... That's it was next a, week. It was a bit like that. But then I so was the forget. treatment of Angus Dayton on this programme. <laughs> I never... So, yes, it's the, it's the latest developments on Iraq. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not register in your brain, William, that booing. No, it's used you to it. You'll find it washes over him, boy. Oh, oh. <laughs> We were the Tory party long enough to know how to ignore booze. <laughs> yeah. so, so you weren't very popular it's then? It's the... Uh, <laughs> so, listen, just because I tell jokes doesn't mean you should have political opinions. <laughs> anyway, since the latest development on Iraq, at a European mini-summit, ministers called... Ministers called for the creation of a European Rapid Reaction Force. So the next time there's a war to be fought, they can decide to do nothing even faster. <laughs> the Rapid Reaction Force will consist of soldiers from Belgium, France and Luxembourg. Ooh, scary. <laughs> so, Paul and Jeremy, look at this. Ah, oh, yes, this is uh, Techwin Wittock disease. Uh, 
<laughs> so how to spread it, you sort of just get a hose pipe and spread it around. So that gives it away. That gives it away, doesn't it? Makes Arse. it an easy question. Michael Jackson, another one of his kids. <laughs> Well, it's SARS. It's SARS. It's the epidemic. The world's least frightening disease. <laughs> well then, you've because worked Because 90 percent of the people who get it are fine, and the only ones who die are the ones who are treated in jungle clearings. <laughs> <laughs> My geography's not too hot. How many jungles are there in Beijing? Well, there's a wood. <laughs> <laughs> SARS isn't scary. That's the most important. Only in the Daily Mail is it scary, where everything's scary. Yeah. Yogurt is scary. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was right. a Canadian PR stunt to get on the news. <laughs> like we've got it. it. Yes, we've got it. We've got, we've got SARS here. We're, look how important we are. We're so important, people come here with SARS. And what's said to have started SARS? It's chicken, isn't it? Chicken. Now, yes, isn't it to do with living close to chickens? You would know about this, Ian, wouldn't you? <laughs> you, know, you, you were brought up in Hong Kong. I wasn't referring to anything more recent than that. Oh, right, yes. <laughs> I must go home. There's been a chicken invasion. <laughs> I was brought that. up in Hong Kong, so yeah. if anyone My wants chickens. to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Who's issued a profits warning as a result of this? Cafe Pacific. That's not funny, it but, might be the answer, but, but, actually. Well, you know, you're getting warm. Walt Disney, because they're planning to build a Disneyland in Hong Kong. Hong Kong's about that big. <laughs> yeah, but Mickey Mouse is only that big. <laughs> The worst place in the world. I've just come back. You went to Disneyland? I've never been anywhere so horrible, ever. No, really? apart from Wensbury. Oh. <laughs> Other than Wensbury, it's the worst place in the world. It's not much of a slogan, is it? The worst place in the world. Apart from Wensbury. <laughs> this is the worldwide spread of severe acute respiratory syndrome, or SARS. As this is quite a sensitive subject, we're aware we might get some complaints. So the BBC have asked me to say, if you know someone with the disease and you're thinking of writing in, please don't lick the envelope yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Ian and Linda, a headline for you. Charles's grey goo nightmare. Ah, oh, this is Prince Charles and his worry about, um, I think they're called nanorobots. Very good. They can miniaturise these robots that can work on um, the molecular structure of atoms so that the whole universe turns into a grey goo. So we can laugh, but the day that we all suddenly turn into goo, <laughs> we'll be saying, ha-ha, we shouldn't have laughed at Prince Charles. He actually said, I fear genetic disaster. <laughs> You're suggesting for a hereditary monarchy, that's asking for it. <laughs> I can see them all on the balcony there, the royal family. There's about 12 people, only three different faces. <laughs> One of them's on a corgi. <laughs> <laughs> but, robots? Yeah. The size of this studio can't make a voxel properly. <laughs> Isn't there a danger this technology could get so small we won't be able to find it? <laughs> yes, this is the warning from scientists that mini robots could escape and eat the whole planet, turning it to a grey goo. Stop me if I'm getting too technical. <laughs> According to Labour's Science Minister, Lord Sainsbury, nanotechnology could be huge. <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't quite got it, has he? <laughs> One critic of Charles's anti-science pronouncements complained he has some very green advisers, most of them in window boxes. <laughs> lamenting, the lack of... <laughs> lamenting the lack of public debate on the subject, Dr Peter Singer said, go into a British pub and say nanotechnology and no one knows what you're talking about. Mind you, go into a British pub and say local elections and you'll have the same problem. <laughs> William, did you vote today? I have voted by post. You vote. I just, I just want to have make... you voted. I have voted. Who did you vote for? Um, well, I don't know if anyone ever told you. It's a secret ballot in this country. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like to know. We'd all like to know. Rest assured, it wasn't you. <laughs> well, Paul and Jeremy, your turn again. Don't hail Hitler. Since the success of the Great Britain's uh, programmes have sold this idea, if you can sell such an idea around the world, and the Germans are going to do the, you know, your favourite Germans, but they're not allowed to vote for Hitler. But it's not just Hitler. Uh -huh. It's anyone of a right-wing persuasion. Right, so that's Blair that's... out then. <laughs> <laughs> Karl Marx is the only one, because he's the only one that's not right-wing. It's between him and Michael Schumacher. <laughs> Do you know how they're defining German for the purposes of this programme? By racial purity. <laughs> Austria. <laughs> <laughs> the 
<laughs> they are actually including Austria, which is how all the trouble started in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> if they had included Hitler, where would he have come? First. According to one uh, report from the German authorities, they said definitely not in the top three. <laughs> <laughs> How very reassuring. Yeah. But it's not as tricky as it'll be when they do it in America. When they're asked to vote on who was the greatest American of all time, and it's Tom Cruise. That's what I'm waiting for. So you know it will be. Yes, this is the forthcoming German version of the BBC programme, 100 Great Britons. The German writer Goethe has emerged as an early front-runner in the poll. Uh, while the Germans are very familiar with our winner, Churchill, most Britons think that Goethe is a song. <laughs> <laughs> and so to round two, and with the news this week that John Humphreys is to take over as the host of a new series of Mastermind, it'll be interesting to see how many contestants can get their answers out before he interrupts. <laughs> So, just to show that if Humphreys can do it, any idiot can, here's a quick roundup of some of the smaller stories of the week in quiz form. So, fingers on the buzzers. What do you have to eat 40 quid's worth of to get a free basketball? Chocolate bars. Um, Cadbury's have decided that the best way to get children fit is to fill them up full of chocolate. <laughs> if they're trying to get fit, they'd be better off eating jammy dodgers than chocolate, cos that's got that... Sports jam in it, hasn't it? It's 30% lycra. Mm. You, know? <laughs> you take a little bite and you've got a full upper body workout. <laughs> and that is science. Critics have complained that the scheme is simply an underhand way of gaining free advertising for chocolate, such as Cadbury's Flake, which uses only the crumbliest, flakiest chocolate, <laughs> and in my view, tastes like chocolate never tasted before. <laughs> Um, next question. Whose shopping list this week included tighty whitey undies? <laughs> Yours? <laughs> a guess, but. Uh, a I do on. know who you are now. You're from that political party from the olden days. <laughs> the future. Yeah, oh, no, I don't think so. The only one anyone recognises is Anne Widdicombe. And she's confused us all by going blonde. I was watching her for half an hour on question time thinking, blimey, Sue Barker slapped on a bit of weight. <laughs> Tighty whitey understand 67 it... other items were bought on this shopping trip. Oh, got it. Mrs. Here we Blair. go. Cherie. Yes. It was Cherie. What was she doing? It's the Australian Cherie. supermarket sweep. You get invited by the government as the wife of the Prime Minister to run round the shop and shove it all in your bag. We should just point out that Sherry Blair was offered to pay for all the goods. She actually bought clothes with a logo featuring a character called Julius the Cheeky Monkey on. But she avoided clothes with this character, Cherie L. Bandit. <laughs> And one onlooker remarked she's taken everything but the kitchen sink, at which point Cherie walked back in with a spanner. <laughs> Next question. What's four inches long, more than 20 years old, and sold for £2,500 this week? Yes, uh, it's Bob Linda. Marley's dreadlocks. It is indeed Bob Marley's dreadlock. There it is, four inches long. How does Bob Marley like his donuts? That's We're not... jamming. We're jamming. Absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Marley's lock of hair is four inches long yeah. and plaited in a dreadlock and in one respect is very this. similar to Ian's. Going, going, gone. <laughs> um, <laughs> very similar to some people's career. No, that's... <laughs> uh... Next question. Who's officially richer than the Queen? Prince um, Philip, because he's got her money as well as his own. Yeah. <laughs> what was it that caused the Queen to go down the list? I think she gave up a little cleaning job she had. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it was. She, had, she used to do a couple of hours, local pub. Yeah. And what she just, just used to use a waving hand. She used to just <laughs> have a duster. Right. And she just. According to the Daily Express, the Queen has seen her fortune plummet after she paid off the Queen Mother's debts. Coincidentally, the highest new entry into the rich list is a Mr. William Hill. <laughs> and now, next question. <laughs> what have Rainbow Trout been trying to tell us this week? <laughs> Paul and Jeremy? Ow. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's this great thing yes. that fish can't feel pain, but of course they, they can. It seems to be demonstrated that they can. But the anglers have always said that they can't feel pain. There's no reason why they should feel pain. They're swimming along, great big hook goes in their mouth, hooks them out. They go, oh, 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 go into the net, boom, 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 back in the thing. They don't feel any pain. <laughs> Because I've never told us they feel pain. I don't well, think I foxes feel pain. <laughs> well, 
no fox has ever told me that it felt pain when I ran one over the other day on purpose. <laughs> I could have braked, I chose not to. <laughs> the debate all hinges on whether fish are simply <laughs> reacting to a stimulus or whether they are experiencing an emotion. To many people this will seem like a meaningless distinction, but it is not, said a trout. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, who clogged up the cosmetics counter at Selfridges this week? Paul and Jeremy. 600 very overweight naked people. 600, <laughs> what were they doing then? They were posing for that man called Spencer Tunick. Tunick. Is that his actual name? Spencer Tunick? It's not a very good name for a man who has <laughs> naked yeah, people. <laughs> there we are. They were worried someone would press start on the escalator. <laughs> I read an account from someone who said she didn't get out much. <laughs> and her daughter had suggested to her, why don't you go and take all your clothes off in Selfridges? Be good, get you out of yourself, meet some people. <laughs> like playing bridge, except slightly more interesting. <laughs> 600 people took part, 598 performance artists and a Swedish couple who were just there for the sales. <laughs> it happened at 6am, which meant that many of them were up at the crack of dawn. <laughs> and at the end of all that, the scores have moved on to Ian and Linda. Eight points, Paul and Jeremy, ten points. <laughs> Round three is the <laughs> round. Ian and Linda, your four faces are Jean-Claude Van Damme, Richard Keel, Peter Stringfellow, and Abu Hamza. <laughs> the man with the teeth, that's that man who was a Bond villain, isn't he? The man mm. with the metal teeth. George. George. Now, Abu Hamza couldn't be a Bond villain because no cat's going to let him stroke him with that, is he? <laughs> <laughs> is it to do with sort of metal bits kind of in bits you. in you mm. or on you? No. No, it isn't. It's about a nocturnal activity. Oh, right. Oh, lap yes. dancing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh. yeah. Yeah. The top left one, he's the only one that's been buggered by a panda. <laughs> <laughs> well, Abu Hamza, he's a former lap dancer. Well, actually, he's a former what? He's a former leader of the Conservative Party. <laughs> he's a future. Getting less warm. Did he run a nightclub? No, he's a... He, he did. Was... Uh, nightclub bouncer. Nightclub bouncer? Oh, you wouldn't, so... mess with, you wouldn't want him feeling your collar, would you? <laughs> oh, dear. Well, string fellow's the odd one out, cos he owns a nightclub, he's never been a bouncer. Right, very good. What's he not uh, getting at the moment, Abu Hamza? Well, he's not getting out of Britain, is he? <laughs> a well, pair of gloves least... for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> the son, of course, tried to help him get out of Britain by popping a British Airways ticket to Cairo through his letterbox. <laughs> what was the reaction of his spokesman, according to the Express? Sheikh Hamza would be more than happy to bugger off to Egypt. <laughs> it's like Ian Duncan Smith this week, isn't it? He said the word bullshit. What did you think of that? I think he's entitled to say anything he wants to say. <laughs> it's not like anyone's going to hear it. <laughs> yes, the answer is they've all worked as nightclub bouncers, except Peter Stringfellow, who runs a nightclub in the Westminster area full of nude women, so I'm told by many of my fellow MPs. <laughs> Uh, Peter Stringfellow famously claims to have slept with over 2,000 women. Might sound a lot, but given how old he is, that only works out at half a dozen a year. <laughs> <laughs> According to the Sunday Times, the FBI alleged that Abu Hamza helped Richard read the shoe bomber. I don't know in what capacity, but I can guess it wasn't tying his laces. <laughs> Paul and Jeremy, your four are T.S. Eliot, Jacques Chirac, Rebecca Wade, and Pol Pot. T.S. Eliot, what do we know about him? Obviously a poet. His most famous poem was The Wasteland. It's um, a very small cup of tea, Chirac Scott. Unless he's a very big man. <laughs> <laughs> you just can't tell. Which he is. Yeah. I have a theory. Go on, then. Has it got anything to do with this question? <laughs> Paul Pot was in Paris. Yeah. Rebecca Wade studied in Paris. Yep. T.S. Eliot was in Paris. I don't know whether he studied. And Jacques Chirac was in Paris. And he That's... studied in Baghdad. <laughs> no, he didn't. He went to the, their equivalent of the LSE. Well, maybe that Chirac makes him the odd one out then, because obviously you would expect him to study in Paris because he's French. But, but... he did study in Paris. Oh, he did, so he's mm. not the odd one out. Maybe then. he can't speak French. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Makes noises. It. All the others are fluent. I think they all studied in Paris except I'm going to except Chirac. Well, very close. I think we'll give you the point. The answer is that Jacques Chirac is the only one not to have studied at the Sorbonne in Sorbonne. Paris. Oh. So very You're good the effort there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
you know Rebecca Wade very well, Jeremy. You, you write well, I'm, I'm sure not very papers. well, obviously. So, <laughs> what was she wearing to work on her first morning as editor? It wasn't Rebecca, but she appeared on page three. Well, it said Rebecca from Wapping on page three. Right, yeah. and she was wearing a page three badge. And was yeah. this ironic for any reason? Well, because people suspected that when a woman took over as editor of The Sun that there was going to be no more page three girl, and then she was keen, I think, to say that there will be. And yeah, so that's because people name. thought that she was becoming editor of The Sun, whereas we all know that Mr Murdoch edits The Sun. <laughs> <laughs> and what about Jacques Chirac? How did the French uh, justify voting for Chirac rather than Le Pen? Oh, they had banners up which said, vote for the crook, not the fascist. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to suggest this to Geoffrey Archer next time. <laughs> God, he fooled you, though, didn't he? He really did. You used to use his gym, didn't you? Well, actually, he's very... Was it really a gym, though? Because I can imagine him saying, come and use my luxury gym, and you get down there, and there's just a Black & Decker bench master. <laughs> <laughs> Was it Michael Crick? Was he the biographer? Didn't, yes. didn't he write the letter to you saying, outlining six or seven different points about Geoffrey Archer, why he, you shouldn't endorse mm. him as candidate for mayor no, of London? I didn't, actually. He says he did. did but you? do you regret <laughs> that? Do you, feel, do you feel a bit of a fool? In, just think, in retrospect. I think it was my biggest mistake. Right. Really? Right. Well, that's honest. <laughs> Talking of which, an honest politician, you don't meet many of these. No. Um, <laughs> how did the... Uh, Talking of which, how, what were your how other did mistakes? the... How did the... Uh, what were your other mistakes? What's the second biggest? <laughs> I just concentrate on the biggest. That's a big, big enough one, actually. How did the Sun describe Jacques Chirac during the Iraq war? They called him <laughs> Le Worm, right? Yeah. And uh, the Sunday Telegraph didn't have much time for him either. They said, Chirac has done so many turns, he has to screw his socks on. <laughs> Since Chirac's anti-war stance, Americans have taken to calling the French cheese-eating surrender monkeys, something I totally disagree with. They left out wine-guzzling. <laughs> French President Jacques Chirac worked on board a ship before entering politics, like John Prescott. He was a left-wing firebrand who turned right-wing as he got older, like John Prescott. And he speaks fluent English. Uh, let's have a look at the <laughs> with, with one round to go, Ian and Linda have eight points. Paul and Jeremy have 12 points. And so to the missing words round, featuring this week's guest publication, a particular favourite of mine, Black Belt Magazine. <laughs> Although I'm a blue belt myself, and that's the way I like it. <laughs> do you still practice then? You do, do you still do a weekly... Oh, yeah, once or twice a week. Yeah. Can you yeah. kill people with your bare hands? <laughs> yes, but only one editor at a time. <laughs> We better start the actual uh, questions. Try what for the world's best value meal? Eating your own foot. <laughs> You'll not fall over, but it's cheap. <laughs> Looting. Yeah, now, the good. actual answer from Black Belt magazine is Jeet Kundo grappling. <laughs> isn't. You can't fit that in there. <laughs> well, you've just you've skipped down too many, haven't you? I have. I've skipped an answer. Oh. I've skipped an answer. <laughs> The answer is Ludlow, the okay. Merchant House, a restaurant <laughs> in the Shropshire town of Ludlow, no, has one, seven yeah. tables clustered around a log fire, which is what passes for entertainment in Ludlow. <laughs> so let's have the next question, which has now got very easy. <laughs> when to try what and when to not even think about it? We don't know if that's a blank or is that a black belt that's actually physically been stuck <laughs> in the face. <laughs> what you said before? Jitch New New Guinea. That's what a Yorkshire yeah. accent. The answer, as Thank I previously you. gave away, is Jeet Jiu -jitsu. Kundo grappling. <laughs> Next, fat motorists are more prone to do what? Drive Crash. while being obese. <laughs> the answer is... Eat the airbag. The answer... <laughs> Eat the airbag. The answer is accident. <laughs> A survey in New Zealand reveals that fat people are twice as likely to be injured in car accidents as average-sized people, mostly because they're driving too fast after pizza delivery boys and ice cream vans. <laughs> <laughs> Next, what could spread around the world? The biggest tub of margarine. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a stop, it's comets still slide off us. <laughs> 
They're going to coat the world in margarine. You've heard about this. There's a comic coming in about two years' time. They're going to coat the world in blue band. It'll just go zoom like that. <laughs> the answer is classical Korean swordsmanship. Oh. Next, George led an unassuming life until he became what? Assuming. <laughs> No, it's actually Andrea, the militant stripper. <laughs> uh, she says, life isn't a dress rehearsal. Odd thing for a stripper to say. <laughs> and finally, what helped Ju Bang Lee develop his skills? No bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Does it take Win Widdick? <laughs> it's a pretty Is it hard Yu Bang Head? <laughs> He's another martial arts expert. <laughs> Uh, these are all good theories, but the actual answer is throwing knives at rats. <laughs> this, I don't think you could have been expected to get that. Despite all that, his restaurant still came second to a little place in Ludlow. <laughs> well, that brings us to the in end a of... a fight between you and Seb Co, right? <laughs> Didn't you nearly kill him once? He did pass out, but it, well, that's different from actually being killed. No, but he... <laughs> background. <laughs> <laughs> Who would win between Frank Bruno and Anne Widdicombe? <laughs> it would have a go there, wouldn't it? <laughs> My money's on Anne. <laughs> <laughs> and that brings us to the end of tonight's contest, and the final scores are as follows. Ian and Linda, nine. Paul and Jeremy, 14. It's all fixed. <laughs> Before we go, there's just time for a quick caption competition. <laughs> That's where you can put the euro. <laughs> Is this bloke on the bottom left thinking it wouldn't be so bad if I wasn't next? <laughs> next. <laughs> Baghdad Zoo, even the animals go looting. <laughs> And I leave you with news that in Washington, George Bush's image advisers deny they're now doctoring photos to make the president look good. <laughs> There's a security scare in Westminster as an unsuspecting Robin Cook comes within range of an anti-personnel grenade. <laughs> And at the Science Museum, one visitor is enthralled by the new virtual reality exhibition, World of Pies. <laughs> Good night. If you're passionate about any of the programmes you've watched on UK TV Documentary, let us know by logging on and leaving us a message at uktvdocumentary.co.uk. doing this one wrong, but I obviously did. Sometimes it's for edit purposes. Somebody might have spoken over what you were saying. Yeah. Probably you, actually. <laughs> um, OK. According I to the day... I was speaking over. <laughs>